Let's talk about multi-tenant web applications on uh, ASP.NET Core. Uh, my name is Gunnar Peipman and I am one of ASP.NET MVPs. Uh, most of the material I present you uh, is uh, something you can actually use in practice if you are uh, building multi-tenant uh, web applications. I have a few resources available. Uh, source code uh, is uh, from practically the same uh, demo application that I'm uh, using in this presentation. Uh, you can uh, also find a lot of information uh, about, uh, about ASP.NET Core uh, in my blog. Uh, I'm using my blog often as a you know, ex uh, extension of my brain. So if I find a solution to some problem or I work out something, uh, then I will blog about it because uh, when I later need the same thing, then uh, it's easy to go back and, and find it. So the blog is, let's say, by developer to developers. Uh, and you can also follow me uh, in Twitter. I'm not too chatty, I promise. Okay, but uh, let's get started with the multi-tenancy. Uh, Wikipedia offers us pretty good definition, uh, but I like it uh, to say a little bit shorter way. It is, uh, let's say multi-tenancy is when we use the same uh, hosted code base to serve multiple separate customers. So, uh, drivers for multi-tenancy uh, are today uh, many. There are companies who are, uh, who are uh, providing, let's say, some platform to a wide range of customers. And suddenly, they have, a, let's say, so-called a little bit bigger customers who say that, okay, we like your solution. But we, we would like to have only our own data here. Uh, can, you, can, can you do it uh, somehow? That it's the same solution, but it looks a little bit different and, uh, and uh, you don't show your own data. So I have seen how uh, one uh, portal went uh, uh, to multi-tenant application because of uh, such pressure by customers. Also, uh, many companies who have uh, some, let's say, uh, information system that is, that give, is giving them advantages in a field they are uh, operating, they decide that instead of uh, instead of operating on a field, they uh, better uh, start uh, to be, let's say, a solution provider, so uh, or a platform provider meaning that the good application they have, they have to make it multi-tenant application uh, to serve the whole market in uh, their new role. It of course means that uh, they have to, in this case, uh, they have to exit what, whatever they did because it's very hard to sell some platform if you are competing with your customer base at the same time. I have seen how uh, companies are just uh, pushing out from, uh, pulling their th selves out from market uh, just because they want to be a platform providers. And also, it is very easy to, for, uh, for now to build uh, greenfield applications with multi-tenancy in mind. Uh, so, uh, now uh, here is a one illustration showing uh, uh, how it looks if we have a single tenant or we have a multi-tenant. So, uh, in a single tenant uh, world, we have a, we have a application deployment uh, per customer and uh, they all have their own databases. In a multi-tenant architecture, uh, we have a we have practically a shared code base, shared service instances, and, uh, but usually we still keep uh, databases uh, separate. 
It's actually the matter of uh, deployment, uh, and this is a, the next topic, how to, how to host uh, these multi-tenant applications. I go through this, uh, let's say, a theoretical part before uh, getting, uh, getting hands uh, dirty with uh, bits and bytes. Okay, so uh, perhaps uh, one uh, most co cost-effective model is a shared one where uh, uh, groups of tenants are using, uh, uh, using practically uh, the same services. They can even use, uh, let's say, same file storage in a cloud, but uh, having just the different containers, they may also uh, share the same database. This is a, the thing I actually don't like at all, because, uh, you know, uh, if uh, somebody is managing a database where uh, data from multiple tenants is held, and uh, then there is, let's say, a simple uh, delete or update query, and the guy who is running a query forgets uh, to specify tenant ID, by example. So uh, it fixes uh, something in data for one tenant, and uh, and for another, let's say, five tenants, it uh, ruins something. So this is why I don't uh, like uh, the idea about the shared data, in a, especially in the SQL databases very much. But still, if you have a service, you have a bunch of uh, very small customers. I don't mean uh, they are uh, necessarily very small companies, but uh, they, are, they don't make heavy use of service. So. Uh, in this case, uh, you suddenly see that, but we can actually uh, uh, save some, uh, some expenses if uh, we put uh, these tenants together and uh, let them share practically all resources. Uh, the most common, common way is to use a kind of a hybrid, a hybrid hosting model where uh, uh, some services are shared between tenants, and uh, some services are are uh, totally totally separate. Uh, this uh, this model, uh, in my opinion, is uh, most popular because uh, I have, for example, uh, some customers who say, "Okay, we want to use uh, we want to use uh, your uh, your app hosting on Azure. It's okay for us, but." Our database, our file storage, uh, will be uh, in our Azure subscription, and no other uh, tenants uh, are allowed to access it. So uh, this requirement is a pretty common uh, when uh, there are companies uh, with, uh, let's say, not extremely strict IT policies. Uh, now. <laughs> You must also be ready for those companies who have very strict IT policies. So uh, these companies may ask you something like this. We have our own Azure environment. Uh, we set up all services that, that uh, your solution needs. It's okay for us. And, uh, but we are not okay uh, to share uh, a single byte with any other customer. So we have our own environment and uh, we would like to use your application in this environment. And of course, don't be surprised when uh, uh, some company is asking uh, you if you can uh, host uh, this uh, service in their on-premises environment. There are reasons uh, why uh, these requests uh, may come. There are, you know, companies, agencies, where when you enter a door, you have to uh, put to locker all your all your mobile phones, keys, and so on. So uh, you don't have you can't have any photo photo camera with you, and so on. Uh, these kind of customers may want. Uh, your, your service to run in their premises. So, uh, in practice, 
what, what happens in practice, it's, it's a mix of uh, all, all these models I mentioned previously. So you have uh, these small ones uh, who don't put any, any, any big load on the system. Uh, probably sooner or later you just uh, say that let them keep on this bunch of Azure services. It's okay, there is, a ro there is room enough uh, to host another load of uh, the so-called uh, uh, small tenants. Then there are those uh, 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 hybrid ones and, uh, and of course, uh, dedicated ones. So, uh, now let's get to bits and bytes. Uh, when I started with, uh, with uh, multi-tenant applications on ASP.NET Core, I practically had a, a few options how to do it. The system uh, I was building, uh, it, it already was a work, working system, but without the support for multi-tenancy. So, uh, one possible way to go was, uh, uh, was uh, just to put uh, as less effort in as possible and say, okay, I hack this system to be multi-tenant one. Uh, yeah, another option was uh, to say that, okay, let's uh, take a step back now uh, and let's think uh, what changes we need to do uh, uh, also in uh, system uh, technical design architecture to make it support multi-tenancy, the way that it doesn't grow to be a nightmare somewhere in the near future. Uh, so, uh, first, I, I thought, okay, uh, as we cannot, uh, we cannot easily, uh, easily estimate uh, how one or another customer wants uh, their uh, cloud resources uh, to be used or how they, or if they have already something in a the cloud, then I said, okay, let's create some kind of a uh, thing we call a tenant definition. So let's make it to be a simple uh, data transfer object uh, and uh, let's not make any other uh, restrictions on this because uh, perhaps today we want uh, one bunch of settings tomorrow, we add uh, some more additional settings and so on. But it must be something very simple and, uh, and we have to consider one thing. Uh, probably these tenant definitions live somewhere outside from, uh, uh, from uh, this uh, multi-tenant application. So uh, we probably have uh, one day uh, some additional uh, internal application where we manage all these tenants. So, and uh, this tenant definition will be just a nice, uh, a nice data structure uh, that web applications can use to understand where resources are located for given tenant. Uh, now, uh, next question that came to my mind was, uh, okay, uh, for ASP.NET Core application, uh, we need, uh, instead of uh, writing uh, all kind of functionalities, uh, write the core, uh, it's better to be flexible. And uh, always one thing uh, I'm uh, a little bit afraid of is, uh, the, the thing that, okay, today we make a solution that is very simple. Suppose uh, these uh, tenant definitions are today just some kind of uh, JSON files. Easy. They're easy, to, uh, easy to, re to read from cloud storage. Why not? Uh, tomorrow is a new day, new situation, more customers. And uh, then suddenly uh, these uh, simple JSON files doesn't work out so well. So probably we need uh, something more uh, powerful. So I thought, okay, uh, let's define some kind of a tenant provider. 
that uh, a web applications can use. So I define interface and uh, and I keep it uh, simple uh, simple enough that uh, uh, there is no additional burden. But I can uh, uh, over time, if needed, I can write my own implementations. So if a JSON file is not enough anymore, uh, then I can uh, I can easily write new implementation. Suppose we are uh, reading uh, tenants information uh, from uh, a SQL database or uh, from some uh, uh, some REST based service, and it turned out to, out to be actually a, actually a pretty good uh, <laughs> pretty good solution because it didn't uh, took uh, much time when I got the situation when uh, the customer grew out from uh, these simple JSON files. So, uh, of course, my customer came to me uh, looking like a serious uh, sinner from some, some holy painting, asking, okay, you know, this uh, simple JSON file, you know, we need something more today. Is it too much work or not? Okay. I like when people uh, want to order something and they ask if it's too much work. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks uh, to this kind of uh, flexibility, I built uh, at first place. Uh, <laughs> it was actually a few hours of work for me to uh, uh, to <laughs> just implement another tenant provider attach it to a web application and uh, then with one PowerShell command uh, deploy uh, applications uh, again. So I, I, I will show you also the code. I first just uh, tell you what are the parts I built uh, for multi-tenancy support. Okay, uh, then of course we always have a situations where there, there is a uh, suppose uh, some uh, tenant uh, that is not functioning yet or somebody finds a way how to make request to web application without uh, uh, without web application uh, knowing what the tenant uh, it actually is so uh, we somehow uh, instead of uh, showing some uh, ugly uh, uh, 404 error message or something like this uh, somehow we, we should be able uh, to uh, behave uh, behave better, and uh, we, in, if tenant is not found, it's better idea to redirect the browser to some existing page. Uh, the page that explains perhaps that uh, okay we cannot detect the tenant, or uh, some page with. Uh, uh, with a uh, introduction of uh, service, but uh, but but uh, whatever it is, it should be better than just plain 404. So for this, I built a simple uh, middleware component that I uh, attached uh, to ASP.NET Core uh, request pipeline, and then the next question was. Uh, what to do with uh, uh, situations when uh, when really 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 I have to keep uh, uh, I have to keep uh, data of different tenants in same database. As you know, uh, then uh, SQL uh, database uh, wherever it is located, it's uh, it's one of the uh, most expensive forms of uh, data storage. So. Uh, and the cloud is not uh, is not exception. Uh, actually, uh, building uh, this multi-tenant uh, DB context was uh, pretty challenging uh, because uh, there are you know some things in entity, for example, in entity framework core that are kind of okay to use. And when you want to use it in uh, in such an advanced context, then uh, you suddenly have to just invent uh, uh, some uh, not so beautiful hacks. 
uh, I will show you uh, these uh, not so beautiful hacks too. Uh, of course, I hope uh, that over time uh, these uh, uh, bottlenecks uh, necks, uh, will be fixed in a, or changed in entity framework. So, and finally, uh, before going live, I, I almost caused uh, a total disaster because there is a there is a caching implemented in Entity Framework code. So uh, to uh, to make Entity Framework code more performant, the model is cached, and uh, an Entity Framework code is able. Uh, to use uh, to use these uh, cached models, meaning that if we once build up uh, entity framework data context, the model is cached, then uh, it's kind of like uh, the first uh, tenant that uh, got uh, hit uh, and uh, that uh, initialized the entity framework core model will be the winner. Request comes to next tenant, some other tenant, and the, as model is cached, then uh, the wrong model is served. So you can uh, probably imagine what kind of disasters may happen this way. So uh, accidentally, yeah, I, <laughs> I found out, okay, okay, we cannot uh, go uh, like this. There is some part missing, and uh, and I had to. Uh, I had to also uh, build, uh, build uh, this uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic cache uh, provider so I can be sure that uh, uh, every tenant has its own, uh, own model in Entity Framework Core. Uh, so I think uh, I now take a code. I have here uh, uh, one uh, simple application that is running here on my my own machine. Uh, do you want uh, I, these uh, texts uh, to be bigger? Okay, okay. Let's try one hundred. Uh, so, is it okay, or do you want bigger? Bigger. Okay. Let's go one hundred and fifty. So. Is it better? Okay, okay. So uh, this is a now a simple uh, example of uh, of uh, tenant's uh, definition. So practically plain, simple uh, JSON file. Uh, one interesting thing to notice is a attribute called a database type. Uh, by database type, I mean here uh, one uh, one uh, fancy feature. Uh, tenants actually may even use a different uh, different uh, database engine. It is a uh, if you ask uh, if it is a uh, something uh, very hard to implement or not. Uh, on ASP.NET Core and Entity Framework Core, it's uh, it's pretty easy to do. So uh, it, uh, this far, uh, I have tried with a, a SQL Server, MySQL, and Postgre. Uh, these three have been uh, actually uh, no problem uh, databases for me. Of course, uh, yes, SQL Lite is also supported, but uh, in uh, live scenarios, uh, we don't meet uh, SQL SQL Lite. Uh, I think it's more like a, uh, it's more like a good choice if uh, if we have a test environment or something like this. Okay. Uh, now let's uh, take uh, the tenant provider. Okay, uh, I take here, uh, uh, let's say, file tenant provider. It's actually a simple, 
uh, simple uh, file, the simple uh, class that just uh, loads uh, loads uh, this uh, tenant uh, tenant's JSON file. It deserializes it, and uh, and uh, then uh, we have a list of uh, list of supported tenants available. In uh, in real life scenarios, probably uh, you don't get away so easily. Uh, because uh, uh, the, you have a multiple uh, multiple application accounts on uh, Azure, and uh, then uh, uh, you have to be away, you have to be able uh, to uh, load the tenants information the way that uh, every uh, every app service uh, gets uh, its own set of tenants. So, but. Uh, but it's uh, the, but this one is uh, just a uh, you know simple uh, simple uh, demo uh, demo uh, demo provider. Uh, I'm using the one uh, when I'm uh, usually when I'm uh, uh, working out uh, some uh, some uh, solutions in a multi-tenancy context. Uh, so uh, I have something uh, simple to take, uh, something that is uh, you know simple to change. If it comes down just to one JSON file, you know. Uh, I also wrote the uh, provider for a, uh, for a blob storage, so it's uh, possible to uh, uh, to uh, publish tenant uh, tenant uh, definitions to uh, uh, Azure blob storage, and uh, the definitions are loaded uh, loaded from uh, from there. And of course, it's uh, it's possible that uh, that you actually have uh, some other uh, SQL database where tenants are uh, defined, and you are loading uh, data data then uh, from uh, this uh, SQL database. Of course, it's good idea to implement uh, at least some kind of uh, caching uh, because uh, you probably don't want uh, to. Uh, to load uh, these uh, tenant definitions with every request uh, that comes in. Also, uh, also uh, these uh, tenant uh, definitions uh, doesn't uh, doesn't change very frequently. So, uh, <coughs> of course, uh, if you have a lot of uh, a lot of tenants, uh, then uh, the caching uh, also goes uh, goes a little more complex because. Uh, if you have to, uh, let's say, suspend uh, some tenant, then uh, uh, the cache must uh, just uh, time out after uh, some period. So, uh, if uh, so, the, the suspension is uh, really applied uh, in timely manner, not uh, let's say uh, five days later when you make next deployment. So, <coughs> okay, uh, now. Mm, uh, missing uh, tenant middleware. Uh, this is uh, another uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty general piece of code I wrote. Uh, okay, uh, if tenant is not found, then uh, the URL where user is uh, redirected, it is read from application settings. So uh, it's up to you to define uh, uh, actually. Uh, what is the what is the URL? But uh, this piece of code, uh, it's practically like you can take it with a copy and paste, add it to a request pipeline, and it just works. So uh, now let's uh, let's uh, jump uh, to a startup class for a moment. So uh, um, okay, here you can see uh, one thing that. Uh, you probably uh, don't meet very often uh, in uh, in examples you can find from internet. Uh, application DB context is not uh, fully initialized here in a startup, and this is because because of tenants. If we initialize it here, uh, then uh, we have uh, practically one configuration in use, but our situation is a little bit uh, 
is a little bit different. Uh, we are moving uh, very soon to uh, to application DB context. Okay, and here is uh, how I'm attaching uh, missing tenant middleware uh, to uh, request pi pipeline. So just plain simple line of code and uh, reading uh, configura from configuration uh, what is the URL where I should redirect uh, the user. The main complexity uh, fell actually uh, to uh, this application DB context. Okay. Uh, so I said, as I said before, uh, we have to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, turn off uh, default model caching because otherwise uh, we, we end up with an awful mess in live. Okay. Uh, here, when, uh, uh, when Entity Framework Core uh, calls uh, on configuring method, we are making uh, the actual, uh, actual decisions. So here we are checking, okay, uh, what type of database it is. So uh, if uh, here, if it's one, I'm using SQL Server. If it's two, I'm using MySQL instead. And, and believe me, Entity Framework actually survives uh, this kind of tricks very well. So, uh, and, and then I have to say here that uh, I don't want to use a default uh, cache key factory. I want to use my own. And what's the trick? How, how I did the trick? It's here. So, uh, this uh, cache key factory actually uh, must generate uh, some kind of uh, caching key for a model. And, uh, and by default, if, if I'm correct, it is practically making a two string to your application DB context. So, uh, <coughs> uh, now to, uh, to make it work different, to have a different keys, uh, I'm just using uh, <laughs> the tenant ID uh, to uh, uh, tenant ID as a as a cache key. So this way, I make sure that okay, if um, uh, if a model is cached, then uh, at least uh, it is uh, for uh, for this <laughs> tenant, uh, and we don't mix anything uh, together. So uh, it wasn't the kind of uh, hard part to do. Uh, now, uh, the harder work was was to ensure that um, that uh, we cannot ask data uh, from uh, different uh, different tenants. So uh, it is important, uh, actually, important safety net. Uh, especially if you have, uh, let's say, some kind of uh, services that use uh, reading uh, and so on. So the best safety net you have against cross-tenant operations, the better life uh, you live. And here I try to use, uh, I try to use, uh, uh, <coughs> I try to use uh, the, those uh, uh, let's uh, it, it is called a, a global global query queries in entity framework. So uh, and I had to here write uh, some uh, some a little bit bad hacks uh, just uh, uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, tenant uh, data is always coming for a correct tenant. Okay. Uh, in Entity Framework uh, Core 2, we can uh, say uh, for entities that uh, there is a query filter. Uh, this filter is applied to every query uh, that is uh, uh, going, uh, going to database uh, for a given entity. Uh, if we are uh, 
if we are keeping uh, mm, the data from different tenants in the same database, uh, then uh, we we usually have uh, tenant IDs available on almost you know in practically every table. So and and uh, this uh, trick here practically uh, practically ensures that uh, all classes, uh, all our domain classes that inherit from a base entity uh, get, uh, uh, get uh, this uh, gl uh, global query filter. Uh, so, but this is just about, uh, uh, just about uh, a queuing of data. But we have also operations like insert, update, and delete. And uh, these uh, query filters doesn't apply to these operations. So, meaning that if uh, if we mess up something with the tenant IDs, we accidentally do something that is so-called cross-tenant, uh, then a global query filter is not able to protect us anyhow. Uh, now, uh, for this, uh, we ha I found out that, uh, that actually uh, a save changes method of, uh, of database context is, uh, is so-called uh, fi uh, almost the final point where I can uh, override. Uh, the behavior of DB context, and uh, and I implemented I implemented all uh, versions of save changes, uh, adding here uh, one additional check. So uh, it means that we have to use a change tracker of entity framework core. But what we can do is uh, before changes are sent to database. Uh, we can uh, ask about uh, uh, changed, uh, about the changed entities and, uh, and see if, uh, uh, if there is uh, a more, more than one uh, tenant ID involved. It means that we are doing some gross tenant, uh, gross -tenant operation right now or if uh, there is one ID, but this ID doesn't belong to current tenant, then we are again doing some gross tenant thing that is not expected. So, and in this case, uh, uh, I just uh, th uh, threw up a, a special exception where I give uh, these, uh, these uh, IDs that were involved to do, uh, do, uh, uh, this uh, conflict. So, uh, now, um, okay, uh, one word about, uh, about uh, global uh, query filters. Uh, if you have to support only SQL Server, uh, then the SQL Server has also uh, a feature called uh, row-level security. You can uh, actually implement the uh, uh, same kind of, uh, same kind of uh, security net uh, using uh, row level security. So, but uh, if you have to support multiple databases, uh, then uh, you can be sure that, uh, for example, uh, MySQL doesn't have uh, same kind of row level security as a SQL server has and uh, Postgre doesn't also have it. They probably have something else. And uh, now the question is, uh, do we want to uh, go uh, deep uh, to database level with these kind of features, or we let the Entity Framework Core handle it? Handle it and uh, and uh, we just uh, add checks to our uh, DB context. It, it means that uh, we don't use any advanced features, uh, we are controlling everything in uh, application uh, level, but uh, 
but still we are, uh, for us it's easier to support multiple uh, database engines. So uh, now I will, I will run this application. Okay, I open a tenant, uh, tenant file. Okay, uh, for a web applications, often uh, or usually uh, we are uh, detecting uh, tenants uh, by, uh, by host heater. So uh, this is probably the only way how to understand uh, uh, which tenant we have to show. Of course, there are other ways too because uh, we can uh, we can uh, also uh, make uh, this kind of decision uh, based on uh, IP where user is coming from, but uh, this is more rare, uh, rare solution. Okay, so uh, okay, here I have a, uh, some uh, uh, pages open in a browser, so you can see I made a I made a request. And let's see if um, uh, oh, you you are not able to read uh, this. Okay, 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 no problem. Okay, so this is here now one tenant uh, served uh, uh, by uh, by this running application. This is now another tenant uh, here. So. And here we have a third tenant, and uh, this is the one. Uh, uh, this is the one that is uh, actually uh, uh, using uh, uh, MySQL uh, MySQL database, but we don't have any any uh, any uh, code in uh, in our application uh, that uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, you know works uh, kind of differently. All the work is done by Entity Framework Core and, uh, and the database providers. So, so all these, uh, all these uh, tenants uh, are practically uh, served, uh, served from a same running application. Uh, they're using, diff uh, they're using uh, uh, two different databases. These uh, uh, first two tenants are using uh, uh, local DB in uh, in a SQL, uh, MS SQL. They are using even uh, even the uh, same database, uh, and, uh, and the third tenant is a totally different database. Uh, same way, uh, we can uh, specify also other resources like uh, if uh, tenants have to. Uh, have to keep uh, their, uh, uh, let's say, their files in blob storage. We can uh, uh, specify a blob storage account, the blob storage container. If we, are, if our application is using uh, or providing, uh, let's say, uh, Azure, Azure Search uh, as a search uh, server, we can uh, give here a search uh, settings uh, that one or another uh, tenant has to use. So. Uh, now, what were the most uh, uh, most important uh, important lessons? Well, uh, if you want to live easy life, uh, then uh, try to avoid uh, shared database bases. Uh, if tenants are sharing, uh, let's say, SQL Server. In a cloud, it's okay, but uh, but if they are sharing say exactly the same database, then uh, then it's uh, often uh, like uh, kind of asking for troubles. Uh, when uh, when you are building background services for tenants, then again uh, go uh, go with all kind of good advice about cloud patterns and best practices. So try to keep uh, uh, the whole kitchen side of multi-tenant application. 
in, in as good possible order as possible. If you have to work with trading, be very careful. I have seen situations where, where uh, dependency injection uh, component was uh, configured with a little mistakes and it had to handle, uh, it had to work uh, uh, for multiple tenants. So it is, uh, it first it reads uh, tenant, uh, tenant information, tenant's information and then starts uh, running a background services in parallel. It was one awful mistake in configuration and uh, suddenly uh, running treat that was uh, pushed up for one tenant, started handling data from another tenant. Uh, it ended up with a huge, huge scandal, as you may understand. So if uh, as soon as you are working with trading, be extremely careful. Make uh, and uh, and whatever it is, is it a web application or is it a background, something related to background services, whatever. Uh, for cross tenant issues, uh, build as strong safety net as possible. Uh, it doesn't involve only uh, technical solutions. Uh, the ones uh, you saw here in a presentation, uh, like uh, adding a global query filter, uh, throwing exception before data is saved when uh, data from multiple tenants is uh, is about to modify it. Is uh, these are you know technical tricks, pretty easy to implement, uh, or okay, not not very easy as you saw these global filter query filters. Okay, it took a little time to find out how to do it. Okay, but uh, also. Uh, uh, it's important uh, to educate uh, guys who are uh, who have access to uh, tenants' data uh, how to work with the tenants. If there are, for example, uh, some manual steps with a, uh, that need to be done with every deployment, when new code base is going up, uh, it's important that even in these points, uh, people know how to be careful, uh, how, to, how to make these operations uh, the way that uh, they don't uh, explode anything in, uh, in live en environments. Okay, mm. now mm. Uh, some people ask me about multi-tenancy also, the, the questions like, uh, okay, you are talking about the uh, app service on Azure. But, uh, uh, but uh, it's not uh, the only way how to host your application there. I mean, uh, there are uh, containers, Docker containers, Kubernetes containers, and so on. There is even uh, some kind of Azure container service available. Uh, there are also uh, those uh, uh, small virtual machines available. So, uh, what about uh, what about uh, these options? Well, what I what I can say, uh, yes, it's uh, it's uh, very okay if you deploy your application uh, to something uh, else uh, than uh, app service. Uh, even uh, even in these cases, uh, you can uh, automate the process. Uh, if you have a good code base uh, that is covered with the tests, you have a, a very good you know, release processes in place, you can also uh, use, for example, uh, Azure DevOps service, uh, services to, make, uh, to, to fully automate uh, the release process. Of course, make sure that uh, it doesn't happen automatically <laughs> with every succeeded commit. Uh, but uh, there always should be somebody that is saying, 
okay, now this succeeded build will be the release. Okay, uh, we are getting out of, out of time soon. I think you want to go and see also uh, what's going on in, uh, in, uh, in the big halls there. Uh, this, is, uh, this is it by me. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, then we have a few minutes uh, left for questions and answers. So just raise your hand and ask if you, if you have any questions. Yes? Uh, what, uh, see, uh, what I mentioned about SQL Server, uh, row level security. Yes, this is uh, something you can uh, just uh, type in uh, uh, to Google and uh, they're pretty, in a pretty top uh, there. Somewhere in the first two pages should be one good blog posting uh, that is uh, showing uh, how to use uh, row level security for exactly the same purposes. Yes? Okay, if Azure has something uh, uh, to create the tenants automatically with one click. Uh, I don't know if Azure platform has something like this. Actually, most of services running on Azure uh, have, a, have a management REST endpoints. So it's possible uh, for you to write, uh, let's say, a PowerShell script that puts up uh, everything for new tenant. So it is, uh, yes, it's possible to do, but uh, uh, this is uh, still something, uh, something you probably have to do manually. At least write the, the script. Uh, we, are uh, we are putting things uh, currently up ma manually because uh, we don't have uh, such a huge uh, number, uh, you know, uh, tenants uh, coming, but yes, when uh, when it's uh, when <laughs> the number of tenants uh, starts growing fast, yes, we have to automate it uh, somehow. Yes. Excuse me. What? Sessions. Sessions. Hmm? Uh, sessions. Well, it depends on uh, depends on application. I mean, uh, if you, for example, if you have a, if you support authentication, then uh, you have to support sessions anyway. So, it's probably going this way. Yes, 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 and uh, I will publish uh, my slides too. So if you want uh, access uh, to source code faster, then I will be available at experts area and with my laptop so you can ask me and uh, I can give you, uh, I can give you a link uh, right there. Yeah. Yes? Excuse me? Uh, yes, there are uh, some NuGet packages available. Uh, I tried out a few ones. Uh, I ran into some troubles with, uh, with them. But uh, of course, before you start inventing a wheel, then uh, check out if, <laughs> if uh, these pa packages uh, work and uh, do dirty work for you. Of course, yes. Okay. Uh, no more. Oh, yes. Uh, 
over over what? Uh, well, uh, well, if you are not using uh, Docker containers, is uh, then but uh, the plain app service, then uh, yeah, this way it's uh, it's a little bit easier to go for you. And uh, even when you use Docker, then your Docker container can also uh, uh, one container may also uh, manage uh, multiple tenants. Actually, you may have a you know a cluster of con Docker containers for one set of tenants, another cluster for another set of tenants, and so on. So, okay, guys, uh, we are practically uh, on our time. So I will be available uh, at the expert area, hanging around there, so we can uh, continue discussion uh, there. Uh, th thanks for coming here. Uh, it was very nice to see you. Thanks.